Hello, I'm George Plimpton. Our guest today on Writer's Workshop is a writer best known for her commanding role as the New Yorker magazine's film critic. In fact, I think it's probably accurate to say that she is one of the first movie critics to achieve real influence throughout the movie business and throughout the movie world. Her name is Pauline Kael. And I think one of the things that young writers are going to find most fascinating about her is a kind of paradox, a paradox of personality that is not at all uncommon in the writing world. We'll see Pauline Kael, a writer who is really America's reigning film critic, as a very modest human being, somebody who will tell the students at this workshop that she's not at all sure she should be advising beginning writers at all, because among other things, she was past 45 before she was able to make a living from her own writing. And yet, finally, she does give that advice. And we understand what kept her going through all those lean years. Kale's advice is simple. Be sure of yourself and your work. Once you strike a position, hold on to it. Don't back down. And realize that you, the writer, particularly in the field of criticism, have no allies. You have only your own conviction and your own talent. As we'll hear her explain to William Price Fox, Benjamin Dunlap, and the students on Writer's Workshop. In your review of Straw Dogs, you said it gets at the roots of the fantasies that men carry from earliest childhood. Do you think movies are as much a vehicle for men's fantasies as always, or do you think things are changing now that a few more women are working in film? Well, I hope that men will not give up exploring their fantasies, because that's one of the most fertile fields in movies. <laughs> and as a matter of fact, the recent film, Bertrand Blier's Get Out Your Handkerchiefs, goes even further than Peckinpah's ever dared into those areas. Peckinpah has never really explored sex beyond a few glimpses in Straw Dogs. I think you might see some real sour rage about women coming out, and it might be quite marvelous. The trouble with most of the women's films now is that uh, they, uh, they're programmatic. They tell us how women should feel, and they expose the smallness of men, but they don't explore how men react to being made to feel small, nor the real sexual tensions that this new programmatic approach to sex uh, creates. How about, how about the idea you had last talked last night about the um, the Italian look of things? They have a bigger, oh, a bigger sure. concept. Why well, philosophically with that? Uh, well, I think that sense? it's it's no accident that so many of our new directors are are Italian Americans, uh, Scorsese, Coppola, uh, and why so many of them are uh, Catholic in their family background, uh, like De Palma and Altman. A uh, part of it is, I think, that Americans have learned that they're not superior to other people. I think the Vietnam War changed us. And uh, we have a different approach to guilt than we used to have. And so Catholics are much more in tune with American sensibility now. We've lost the Protestant feeling that we're getting better and better and that we can conquer all evil. We were learning to accept evil in a different way in our films. But also, of course, the Italians have a head start in movies. If you go to Italy, uh, the buildings are marvelous colors. Uh, the people are looking at each each other all the time. There's, it's a whole visual culture. And the graphic design in Italy, uh, wherever you turn, the fabrics, e everything about Italy is visual. If you go to London, not only are the men not looking at the women in the same way, they're looking down at the gray streets, but the buildings are gray. Uh, there, there's nothing like the sense of color and vivacity visually. And so it's natural, I think, that, that English are great in the theater, where everything is verbal, but the English directors are, are really very weak visually. Uh, it's, uh, it's been true now for about 20 years, I think, that the Italians in Italy are the greatest directors in the world, but their films often don't travel. We simply don't get them because they can only be financed for, for action genre and domestic themes. But when we get Italian-Americans, they not only have that visual heritage, but they have the whole operatic sense that works so well in film. And so I, I suspect that we're going to have many more. Well, another Italian-American uh, just won the Academy Award. Uh, for the deer hunter, which is indeed a visual film. In verbal terms, it's inchoate, it's inarticulate, the characters aren't shaped. Uh, but visually, it's quite extraordinary. With all these characterizations of the Italians, how would you characterize the Americans? 
as the national spirit or even this well, decade, which we're, well, we're, we're about so through with? Well, we're so diverse. I think it's very hard to characterize this except in terms of what groups bring with them here and what then the next generations retain. But for many years, the screen was dominated by Protestant and Jewish directors who basically had the same reformist points of view. And uh, the Jewish directors were very much in tune uh, with, with feelings of, of um, you know, exposing social evil and correcting it. So they were very much in tune with the 30s and the war years. They were really in tune with fighting fascism. And now it's very interesting that the Jewish directors are predominantly uh, the comedy directors. Uh, they no longer work with major themes. And even, even directors like Spielberg and Kirshner uh, work in, in a much more personal way. I think Spielberg is a very great director. Uh, but there's an innocence, a sweetness, a naivete in his work that's totally different from the Catholic tradition uh, that you get from a director like Scorsese or De Palma. Arlene Croce is almost the only critic I like as much as you. Oh, and, and, oh. <laughs> and it seems to me you're both up against the same problem of describing an autistic medium which is not primarily verbal in verbal terms. Well, you see, I think movies are as primarily verbal as visual. Mm -hmm. uh, they're at least half verbal or at least as half uh, uh, sound. And so I have that advantage. I can describe, uh, you know, characters in different terms. Uh, I think Arlene Croce simply has an amazing ability to, to, to give you the feeling of a dancer's body and of what that dancer moves like and to get you terribly excited about a dancer. She had me so worked up about Baryshnikov. I was dying to see him and saw his first New York performance and indeed found myself jumping up out of my seat at one point and I heard a yell escape my throat <laughs> and then I realized it was all right because everybody else at Lincoln Center was also yelling, so nobody heard me. <laughs> it does seem that, that um, critics, as opposed to gossip columnists and um, mm -hmm. uh, publicity men, tend to talk about ideas in film rather than images and words and characters. Somehow they seem to go for the, the literary interpretation as if it were a verbal medium. And I wondered if that were perhaps a corollary of this difficulty of writing about a visual and audio media. Well, I think most people in any field don't do a very good job. That's true of university professors. It's true even of janitors. And, uh, you know, I think someone has said that 85% of the people in any field are incompetent. And I think that's probably true of, of criticism. But the other 15% are often quite marvelous. And it's amazing how hard they will work and how much they will care about what they are doing. The world is really divided, I guess, between the people who, who get deep pleasure from doing a good job and the ones who are just trying to get through the day. And there are a great many critics who are just trying to get through the day, who know they're second rate and who are scared of their editors and scared of their readers and scared of the movie companies and, and with some justification, but are never good enough to conquer their fears. If, if you're good enough, uh, then you bring something to a magazine or a newspaper, you bring it readers, and so you can hold your own judgment. If you're not good enough, then you're at the mercy of everybody, and you have to give in. And so the, uh, the point would be really to try to strengthen your own writing style and develop more courage, because then you're in a better position. I guess the point I'm circling around is that it, you have the courage to be impressionistic. Uh, Many academic writers would I'm suggest. I'm not impressionistic. Well, you make your own response the basis of your My criticism. My own response is the sum total of what I have learned and what I know. And my reviews are as analytic as, as any you're likely to find. The fact that I do not apply a theory does not mean that I'm impressionistic. I object to that word because it is generally used about women critics. Well, I didn't intend uh, that connotation. I, I meant well, that you include your response among the things you analyze, where well, many course, academic critics would else, try to exclude it. Well, what and, else does a critic work with if he's honest but his own response? The other thing is academic opinion or consensus opinion, which means letting other people tell you what you think, which means you're a damn fool and serve no purpose whatsoever. No. But let me say a little bit more about the word. When about the first 10 years I was writing, I was always referred to as an impressionistic critic. And it finally dawned on me why. And that is because traditionally, uh, women uh, 
were highly regarded as writers, but they rarely functioned as critics. And so the idea was that they might have impressions, something might hit them, <laughs> but they really couldn't think straight. <laughs> And for many years, that word impressionistic haunted me in reviews. I mean, women would often say to me, your review is like a legal brief, it's so closely reasoned. And I would wince at that, because indeed I tend to reason very closely. But men would always say how impressionistic it was. And I don't think it was because I was thinking for myself. I think it was because it was their way of dismissing a woman critic. Mm -hmm. And it is still fairly unusual. Uh, to have women critics who are taken seriously. Uh, there have been a great many women in the field of movie criticism, but that's because if, if the publisher had a sister-in-law who was a hopeless mess, uh, she was thrown into the reviewer's job. And movie reviewing was generally not considered worthy of a man. And so a great many relatives uh, and, and women who had failed at everything else got those jobs. And they were really just gossip columnists. Uh, they, they were nothing. But as soon as you have a few fairly impressive women critics in any art form, you will find them put down as impressionistic. And I think if you check it out, you'll find this has happened to just about everybody. Well, it's happened to me. I, I don't know exactly what to make of that. but I, I, right. I think uh, impressionistic, when it's applied to, to my interpretation, means rationalizing one's instincts, um, including one's emotional response, that total response you're talking about, as opposed to imposing some kind of academic formula from which you gradually deduce an acceptable emotional but response. But only bad critics impose an academic formula, and one does not need to rationalize one's instincts. One's instincts are the sum total of one's mind and responses. If, if you can't respond fully and completely as a human being, there's something the matter with you if you're so split that you have to rationalize your instinct. I mean, presumably, if, if you're together at all, all of you is reacting together. I'm not some mechanist making a division between mind and instinct. No, I just take pleasure in your defining and denouncing bad criticism because <laughs> I, I, they seem to be dominant. Well, academics tend to be afraid of new work, and they derive their standards from old work and then impose it on new work. And so they reject practically everything new, and that's why they often have such a bad record for, for opposing great artists, because they're afraid of something that doesn't fit their standards. And in, in criticism, particularly in a pop form like movies, if you're not open to something new, uh, well, you're, a total, you're totally irresponsible and foolish because the old has been done so many times. Everybody jumps on the bandwagon of any old success and repeats it. So it's only the people like Godard and Altman who try to do something new who spell the health of the medium. Uh, Spider, would you pick anything? Uh, when giving credit to our major films, we always seem to emphasize the actors and directors. Don't you think the screenwriter may have been given a bum rap here? Or? Well, not by me, I don't think. I, I, I'm extremely conscious of, of the screenwriter because I think it's almost impossible to make a good movie if you don't start with a good screenplay. A few directors have, by extraordinary visual uh, style, disguised bad screenplays at certain points, but you never get the kind of satisfactory movie you really want. You can get something that you can watch, uh, but it's still, it's, it's not what it could be. And almost any gifted director uh, acknowledges this, except for a few who don't really care about the screenplay and who often run a cropper, who just want visual scenes and then have a terrible time in the editing process because they can't make it go together and often spend, you know, the, the movie will be held back for a year or so while they're trying to make it fit together. But a movie can often be wrecked simply by the wrong actor. You know, when a, when a script was prepared for Bogart and then someone else played the part, it simply wasn't the same. When when a role was written for Judy Garland and then Ann Miller played it, it wasn't the same. And uh, it's all those elements. It is certainly not all the director. On the other hand, you don't get a good movie without a good director. I'm a writing teacher and I'm interested in the writing process. Would you tell us a little bit about your writing process? Do you outline? Do you revise? Well, Does it change for a longer work? Uh, well, a longer work is bliss in the sense that if you have more time, uh, you can put it down, you can think a little bit. 
uh, but I'm not sure it's as true to your own reactions. The great thing about writing fast and writing immediately is that I think you get an almost an exact fidelity to what you really felt because you don't have, uh, you're not worried by what other people then think of the work. You're, uh, you're, you're, you're strictly on your own at the point at which you write about it. And so you're, you're trying to make explicit your own feelings in the, in the act of writing. And of course the excitement is when you discover something about yourself uh, in the act of writing. And that is possible in criticism. I, it doesn't happen often, uh, but I think when criticism is really good, that's what you're doing. I mean, you're working out your relationship to that material. Uh, if it's simply a matter of explaining to other people why a work is, is bad, there isn't the same excitement in the process, and I think the, the prose doesn't have uh, the same power. But if, if it's a process of self-discovery and, and of thinking about new things, of thinking about things you've never got at before, uh, then it's really a very exciting process. And I don't know that it's that different uh, from other forms of writing. Most people think of criticism as parasitic. But when it's really a process of discovery within the work and of discovery within yourself, I don't think it is parasitic. Uh, and, and of course, even when it is parasitic, even when it is strictly judging the work, uh, it's still a necessary function because, of course, the alternative is simply advertising. And somebody in a society has to make these judgments or else people will simply go where the advertising money is. But the process of writing uh, I enjoy. I'm, I seem to be one of the few writers I know who loves to write. And a number of people have worked me over in print for it as if there were something bad about that. Uh, I, I truly, well, for one thing, I waited a very long time in my life to get paid for writing. Uh, I wrote for literary journals for a long time while working at other things. And now it seems like such bliss to be able to be paid for this pleasurable experience of sitting at your own desk and writing. And it's a very rhythmic process. You know, you can go downstairs, make yourself a cup of coffee, bring it up, do anything you like. Uh, it becomes just part of the activity of the day. You know, you can take care of, of a sick animal, you can take care of a sick child, you can do all sorts of things and still do your writing. It's a, it's a very even thing, particularly for a woman, I think, to be writing at home. It's a, it's a marvelous way to make a living. I think I wanted all my life to be able to make a living at home. The only thing I dislike is having to go to the city to see the movies. I love seeing the movies, uh, but it's hell going through the process of getting to the city because I live several hours from New York City. Uh, but, but the process is simply um, thinking, really. I mean, writing is, is simply, you know, putting down what you think. And to be paid for thinking, uh, and to know that you're doing something that, that may even have some value that, you know, that some other people might enjoy that process and share it with you. I mean, that's, that's a marvelous way to live. I mean, I can't think of any better way to live. Would you comment again about seeing the movies only one time and then working on that first impression? Well, uh, some critics like to see a movie several times. I find uh, partly because I write at great length and the writing itself takes time, uh, I, I see it once and also because I don't really want to see it again before the writing because I think I take it in most completely and with most complete sensuous response the first time because movies do ex affect us in all sorts of sensual areas and I think I get all that the first time and I can I can remember the details in the and in the act of writing I fix a movie very clearly in my mind so that I enjoy writing about it from that first experience and I know that other people don't necessarily work that way uh, but this is a a very personal thing for me, and it does work best. Uh, uh, if I go to see a movie again later, very often after the review is written or at some later time, I may see a film again. And uh, it isn't as exciting to me because I, I think I really, I, I blooded it the first time. Uh, and the second time, the suspense is gone. I'm much more aware of the processes that go into the, the illusion. Uh, I see the mechanics more clearly, 
And I would rather write about it in terms of the total impression. I don't want to pick at the mechanics because those are not what you get the first time. And indeed, many people who go to movies over and over are so caught up in the movie that they never do see the mechanics. I tend to be fairly analytic. I see a lot of them even the first time. Uh, but uh, I, I like that soaking it all in and, and getting that experience once. The other thing is that very few movies yield up more on a second viewing, just as very few books yield up more on a second reading. Very few plays yield up more on a, on a second visit. And so I, I find it, for me at least, a waste of time. And I, I always love to see something new. I, uh, that's perhaps why I like innovative film directors so much and innovative writers and actors. Because for me, I've seen an awful lot of movies in my life. And I love the excitement of something new. I always go in hoping for something new, for something different from what I've seen before. And so there's that sense of that first, the first time you see a movie, there's always, you know, the real, the real good wishes for it. Whereas when you go again, if people go again and again, what are they going to see but more and more of the flaws? Is a question from Linda here? She's got a screen play. Are there any directors that, whose work you just aren't interested in seeing anymore? Yes, many. Uh, I, I simply don't go to Michael Winner films anymore. I try to avoid Jack Smite. Uh, there are very successful directors whose work I always find dismaying, such as George Roy Hill. I'm always depressed by it. Uh, the sting depressed me. I knew it was going to be a big success, but it depressed me. I don't like the way he works. I find it claustrophobic, condescending. Uh, it has no real movement for me. Uh, no, there are many directors whose work I don't like. Pauline, these are mostly writing students mm -hmm. and, um, and writers. Can you, if you were teaching school right now, that's a good, mm -hmm. good, good way to do it, if you were teaching school, <laughs> what would you tell them to do with their, with their lives or how, how would they, um, what courses to take, what to listen for, what to uh, read, you know, that kind of God, thing? God, I'm, I'm a very, I mean, since I didn't make a living as a movie critic till I was past 45, uh, I'm not a very good one to tell other people how to manage their lives. I manage my own very badly. Uh, but... Uh, <laughs> I would say... How I told him that. <laughs> yeah, I would say, if you're interested in criticism, don't just go out and take a job at a newspaper. I would say, or don't try to find a job at a newspaper, try to refine your style as a writer by writing longer pieces, more complex pieces. Work at a different job and then try to get a position on your own terms. The trouble with most newspaper reviewing, I think, is the people go out and get the jobs right out of school. Uh, they're, they're scared of the editors. They're scared of the readers. They don't really know a lot. They don't have any particular style. Uh, they don't, they can't command a following, and so they're at the mercy of everybody, particularly the advertisers. It's only if you bring something to the job that you can be free of pressures from your, from your editor and your advertisers. And that's the only way you can really be an honest critic in any pop form, because the pressures are enormous. And it will also help you if you're fired from your job to know that it's because you were good, not because you were bad. Uh, for other kinds of writing, I really don't know. It, it's so difficult now for short story writers. Uh, there are so few magazines that publish short stories. And that it's a diminishing market. You just have to be awfully good. I think you simply mustn't be discouraged uh, for a long period. And um, the terrible thing is that most people who write now don't read. And so they don't know how much of what they're trying to do has already been done. Uh, there is a sense in which a lot of kids kid themselves about not reading by saying they don't want to spoil their originality. And what it really means is that uh, they repeat all the mistakes of the past because uh, they write the same story that a million other students have written and submitted. And it's only if you know what other people are doing that you don't repeat the same mistakes. 
Uh, so I would say that reading is probably about the most important thing a writer can do. Uh, certainly as important as living, which is always talked about, but living doesn't do you any harm either. But if you're going to try to make a living as a writer, you're probably going to have a lot of living to do anyway. And where do the screenplay writers come out of now? Is any trend now at all? Well, the bad ones come out of the film schools, yep. mm -hmm. and they rewrite the movies of the past and uh, rewrite them rather shamefully. Uh, and because they think that's what a movie is, and often they sell them because the movie executives read this and it reminds them of movies of the past. Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. and, and so they make it, and then they wonder why it's so shop-worn and tired and why it doesn't really have any fresh characterization. Uh, the good screenwriters come out of good writing, you know. I mean, it's interesting that Diane Johnson has just done her first screenplay, uh, the novelist Diane Johnson, and, and she's also a very fine critic. And, uh, of course, Judy Rasko, who's doing screenplays, is quite a good writer. I think, it's, I think you have to establish some sort of way of seeing and thinking in order to be a good screenwriter. I don't think uh, this happens from going to film school because the bare techniques of writing a screenplay uh, are fairly simple and nobody cares about the form in which you write it anyway. The real thing is that you can write and that you can write dialogue and create characters and that you can learn as much about from writing fiction or drama mm -hmm. as and a lot more than from going to a film school. This is George Plimpton thanking you for participating in our Writer's Workshop. Please join us again next time. Thank you.